Let's pray. Dear God, as we transition out of talking about your words and really important announcements into reading your word and hearing from you, I pray, God, that you would use me this morning. I thank you for the privilege of being able to talk about your word. And I pray what's in my heart would be something that people could hear, help them to look past me and see you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. We're in the midst of a series. In fact, this is the last week in a series called The Walk. And I get to talk about something that I'm really passionate about. In fact, 18 years ago when I first came to Plymouth Covenant Church, back then, Pastor Frank was our lead pastor. And he told me that I was going to get an opportunity to speak to the entire church. And I could talk about anything I wanted. I had four minutes. um, Four. Uh, Now I get like whole sermons and stuff, so it's kind of cool. But then I had four minutes to talk about something, and back in 1999, I chose to talk about community. It's that important to me. But before we get to talking about that, I came across a quote this week, and I want you to think about it. I want you to see if you agree with it, see uh, how it hits you. Show me your friends, and I will show you your future. Show me your friends, and I will show you your future. In fact, if we have good friends, they can help us overcome temptation. They can help us to accomplish our dreams. They can help us to live out who God wants us to be. Um, If we have not so good friends, that can be the opposite of that. In fact, way back when I was a kid, I was 15 years of age, and I had this friend of mine, his name was Doug, and we had so much in common, we hung out all the time. Doug was 15, and so was I, and he started hanging out with this other kid named Paul, and Paul was five years older than we were. He was 20 years old, and he had a couple things that we really envied. He had a really fast car. He had a job, which meant he had money, and he also had all kinds of freedom that we did not have. Uh, Doug and Paul started hanging out together, and they had some things in common. They loved fast cars, and they loved guns. One day, I was over at Doug's house. And we were just kind of hanging out, and Paul showed up in his Dodge Challenger. And this thing had like a Chrysler 400 engine in it. It was so fast. And he asked us if we wanted to go hang out with him. And he had just purchased a brand new BB gun. So here we are, two 15-year-olds and a 20-year-old, driving around with three BB guns. And something inside me, have you ever felt this before? Or something inside of you felt like, this is really not a good idea. I I should not be doing this. And uh, these guys were shooting things out of the moving car, and I wasn't participating in it, and I, but I wasn't smart enough to get out of the car. We ended up driving to this uh, abandoned parking lot where there used to be a Safeway store, and the Safeway was closed. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning. And here we are in this parking lot, and they had this great idea that we would shoot out a light bulb inside of an abandoned Safeway, and the light bulb was on, and so we had shot, they had shot a hole, and they kept saying to me, hey, Bob, why don't you join us? And I, I knew it was dumb, I knew it was wrong, uh, but something inside of me decided, and I said something like, sure, I'll give it a try. So the three of us are sitting inside this car in the parking lot, and we're trying to aim and shoot, and we had created a hole, and we were just about to take the light bulb out from the inside, and a police car drove into the parking lot. This 20-year-old did, at least in my opinion, one of the dumbest things any human being has ever done. As soon as he saw the cops, he floored it and uh, was spinning his tires like crazy, drove out of the parking lot, and the next thing I know, we were in a high-speed chase. (laughs) He was driving over 80 miles an hour through rural neighborhoods, and I was scared out of my mind. Uh, Eventually, he pulls over and he says, you two get out of the car, and that seemed like a really good idea to me. So we got out of the car, and we walked straight home, and all I could see was three cop cars speeding after him, uh, going off into the distance. That night, when I got to my friend's house, I didn't want to talk to his dad. I didn't want to do anything else. I just wanted to go to bed because I had known I had done something really stupid. So here I am. I'm asleep in my friend's room, laying on the floor, and then I heard eight words that, like, completely changed my life. I'm dead asleep, you gotta imagine this, and this cop is standing over me 
with his foot on my shoulder saying, get up, son. We're going downtown. (laughs) The next thing I know, I had handcuffs on behind my back, and I was in a police car being scared straight. He talked to me about how much money it was going to cost and all kinds of stuff. And I literally, by the time I got to the police station, I was changed. I mean, my whole world was changed. I was never going to break the law again. Eventually, after threatening us, they ended up letting us go. But before I could go home, I had to call my mom and have her get up about 2.30 in the morning and come and pick me up at the police station. I learned something important that day, that if you have the wrong friends, they can lead you in the wrong direction, and they can cause you a lot of pain. But there's something else I want you to think about. Is it possible that if you and I have the wrong friends, they can ruin our relationship with God? See, the Bible warns us quite often about not choosing our friends wisely. In fact, in Proverbs 13, 20, it says, Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fool suffers harms. Those of you that are teenagers and you wonder why your mom and your dad get so upset when you don't choose the right friends, because they know that if you hang out with the wrong people, you'll end up at the wrong destination experiencing all kinds of pain. In Proverbs 18, 24, we read, a person with unreliable friends, listen to this, will come to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer to a brother. There's a comparison between positive influence in your friends and people that will lead you down the wrong path. Um, I want to talk just a second about community. And I want us to think about being able to experience community because I think it's profoundly important. And what community is, it's, it's an authentic relationship where people encourage each other and draw and help draw us closer to God. Uh, But before we can talk about community, we have to talk about the way relationships work. There are four basic kinds of relationships. The first one's public. That's where you connect with people if you have a shared common interest like music. Or let's just say that you have a a team that you cheer for that and they have colors that are blue and orange and they, they win Super Bowls. And whenever you meet them, you kind of have a connection. You're not really friends, but you just have something in common. That those are called strangers. Uh, Other friends are social friends where you kind of meet uh, and you have first impressions. You don't really get below the surface. Uh, They're superficial relationships. They're just acquaintances. They're not really friends. Um, I want you to know that when it comes to community, you aren't going to have community with strangers and acquaintances. If you're going to experience community, it has to be deeper and more intimate than that. Uh, there are also people that are personal friends. They're, there's close connections, and they're forged through shared experience and feelings. They have to know who you are, what it is you value, what it is that you believe in, and what it is that's important to you before they can become your true friends. And I'm going to make an appeal, and I'm going to encourage you and challenge you this morning to find some of those, to find some people that are genuine friends who actually know who you are. Because you won't get to experience the real genuine article just on a superficial level. If you just skim across the surface, you'll never get to what the Bible calls authentic community. And here's the last group. It's called intimate. They're the inner circle friends. It's real and it's raw connections. These relationships happen through our most closely shared experiences and feelings. Often it comes through pain or shared negative experience or a time when we're there for each other or when we experience trials or difficulties and we have somebody that comes alongside of us and listens to us and cares about what it is we're really going through. I want you to think for a second, what kind of friends do you have? Are your friends more the superficial type, the more of the type that uh, you have things in common with? Or are they people that know who you are and what's important to you, and they could actually influence you in positive ways? This morning, we're going to talk about my favorite character in the Bible other than Jesus. His name is, is David. And we're going to look at three intentional relationships that David had. But if we look at it, 
I think we're going to be able to discover what it is that we should be looking for when it comes to the kind of friends that we should look for in order to build the kind of community that the Bible talks about. The first friend that we're going to talk about is a guy named Jonathan. So turn it with me, if you will, in your Bibles to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, Before I get to 1 Samuel 18, I want you to think about this with me. In our best relationships, we share all of ourselves. Think about this. In our best relationships, we share all of ourselves, holding nothing back in spite of our dark corners and hidden skeletons. We want to be fully known and accepted, loved as we truly are. Did you know that you can't be truly loved until you're truly known? Uh, Every single person in this room has skeletons. Every single one of you has has done really dumb things like shot BB guns in the middle of the night at windows. Not very many of us ever share those with other people. Back to our uh, story this morning, or back to our actual event, we're going to look at the life of David, and we're going to see what happened to him. In order for this to make some sense to you, I want to give you a little bit of context. In chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, David was anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. He was a young boy. And he was promised that one day he would be the king. But instead of becoming the king right away, he got to go back to his own house. And he was a shepherd over his father's sheep. And he had to do that day after day, night after night. And one day, his dad sent him on an errand to go and make sure his brothers had food. So here he is taking his brother's food. He ends up going to the battlefront. And at the battlefront, we get to see David versus Goliath. Uh, The story, if you read 1 Samuel, isn't really about David and Goliath. It's about David and Saul. And it's comparing how two different leaders that God uh, was talking about responded to the exact same circumstances. Here's Goliath over on the side calling out Saul, saying, send out a man to come and fight me. And then he starts ridiculing and mocking and shaming everyone else in the audience that were up on both sides of the hills. David was the only one that had the courage, and he said, what are you doing letting this Philistine take God's name in vain? Are you crazy? Somebody's got to go. I'll go. And finally, the people were so scared after day after day of this, they send David, and God uses him to bring down Goliath. And after Goliath comes down, we get to be introduced to the first time that David and Jonathan have a conversation in the Bible. It's not the first time they met. Because we know that David, before, when Saul used to get really upset and used to have bad moods and fits, that God would send David to help calm him down by playing some music. So we know that David and Jonathan already knew each other. But here is the first time we get to hear them speak words to each other. And if we look and if we pay attention, we'll get to see what it is that we should be looking for when it comes to a true friend. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. Uh, This is a a word talking about kind of a level of intimacy and loyalty and genuine friendship. And he loved him as himself. Jonathan actually cared about David. Jonathan loved David more than he did his own self and what his own desires were. Uh, That is a unique situation when other people put you first. When other people care more about you than themselves. Um, I want to pay attention to this just for a second, okay? If you see somebody that pays more attention to you than they do themselves, that might be the kind of person that you're looking for to build a friendship with. From that day, Saul kept David with him, and he did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan, listen to this, made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. That's the second time we're that... Uh, Samuel's pointing this out to us. Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, if you're not careful, you'll just scoot right through this and you'll miss the most important part. All of a sudden, they start meeting and they make this covenant and then David starts taking off his clothes, right? It's not exactly what's going on. Uh, What's going on is that back in those days, uh, only Saul and Jonathan had swords. And remember, uh, Jonathan was a great warrior himself, and he was about to become the next king. He was next in line to be king, and he had a royal robe 
and he had the only other sword besides Saul. And here is Jonathan taking his sword and his robe and saying, you know what? I believe in you. And I can see that God is in you. And God is doing something so special in in you that I care more about what God's doing than I do myself. You can have my sword and my robe. In, In a sense, what he's saying is I recognize that you're going to be the next king and I'm gonna abdicate my place to get what is rightfully mine and let you have it. Now, just think about how weird that is. When we we start reading the story, it doesn't make any sense. But Jonathan is acting in a way where he's acting selfishly in somebody else's best interest, pointing them towards God's calling in them. We get to read, and as we uh, scoot through different chapters, we get to see Saul understands that Jonathan cares more about David and David's kingship than he does his own. So he has a, a face-to-face conversation with Jonathan. He says, Jonathan, you need to listen to this because you are acting like a fool. Watch what he says. Um, do you notice that anytime parents um, see some negative attributes in their kids, they blame it on their spouse? Maybe that doesn't happen in your families, but here it happened here. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, it's your mom's fault. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame? And to the shame of the mother who bore you, as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. He's having a hard heart with his son saying, Jonathan, you've got to pay attention to this because you are next in line for king. And if David becomes king, that means you don't. Don't you understand that you cannot care more about him than you care about me? We have to get rid of that guy. As we continue, um, we, get introduced to, we get introduced to all kinds of other people that have an influence on David. Um, I love chapter 22 because as we're reading chapter 2, we get to know about the people that David hangs out with. Listen to this crew. He gets to hang out with people who are discontented, distressed, and in debt. Um, doesn't that sound like a real fun group that you could hang out with? It's people that are discontented, distressed, and in debt. And they give David all kinds of bad advice. Remember, Saul comes in, and they catch him into a a cave, and everyone says, hey, this is the day you've been talking about. You need to go by force, take the kingship, and all kinds of people are influencing David to do extremely dumb stuff. One day, David is so discouraged and so overwhelmed that he's about to give in and say, I'm tired of it. I'm not doing what God wants anymore, and here we get to see a conversation between the two. Are these batteries dead? <laughs> okay, let me try this again. Whoa, whoa, whoa there it is. Thank you. Um, between services, we're going to have to replace this because this light's like flashing. Does that mean it's not working, Josh? Could I get you while I'm talking to get me a new battery? Thank you. Sorry to call you out like that. Verse 15, while David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, He learned that Saul had come to take his life. Uh, Saul had been chasing David for a long time, and he's got him cornered, and David realizes that he's about to get killed by Saul. Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Um, I, I don't want us to miss this. He helped him find strength in God. There's something about friendships the authentic kind, the kind that we're really looking for, that they can encourage us, they can give us emotional support, they can help us to find strength in God. And here's what Jonathan did for David. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. This is the second time that they made that. In a sense, they they decided to be loyal friends for life. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. Um, Jonathan was a true friend to David. Uh, Here's what you look for in a true friend. Somebody who's that that's willing to come alongside you with emotional support, encouraging words, and give you comfort. There is something that you can get in community, and it's it's the kind of comfort and support that we need when life is difficult. 
The second person I want us to think about is Abigail. As soon as Josh trades this for me. Thank you, Josh. He does a really good job. And he's fast. Um, as Josh is talking about this, I'll tell you a little bit about the story of Abigail. David is getting more and more discouraged because Saul has been pressing in on him over time. Um, he no longer gets to hang out with his best friend. And I think, in, in my opinion, from reading this over and over and over again, that the biggest downfall in the life of David was losing his friend Jonathan. A after that point, he didn't have that person to constantly encourage him to do what was right and what was best. And he was so discouraged. Not only that happens, but uh, he loses his place in the army. He has to uh, hang out, try to do scraps to survive. He has to go to Philistine and pretend like he's insane. And, and then it, it even gets worse because now Samuel, his mentor, dies. And here we are in chapter 25. The guys are eking out, trying to make a living, doing cultural things. And they guard the flocks of this fool named Nabal. And as they're guarding his flocks and as they're doing this stuff, they do everything to protect him. And it comes time to get paid. And back in those days, that was a cultural way of doing things. It was a normal, healthy way to make money. So David's going to get paid. He sends his men out. And Nabal insults David and says, I don't even know who this David guy is or even where he come from. There's all kinds of people that are running away from their master. And in fact, the way that you know it's a really bad insult is the way the men respond. Um, the men as they're telling the story to David, they tell every single detail and every single word. Now, ladies, I want you to think for a second. When was the last time that your husband included every single detail? When was the last time he said every single word that happened? I, I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to give details about stuff, my wife says, what about this? And what about that? And she asked me like 15 questions I have no idea about because I wasn't paying attention to those little details. But imagine how insulting this must have been for these guys to communicate every single words. As soon as David hears the insults and they were bad, the only thing he says is put on your swords, we're going to battle. And he's coming down the hill, and I can imagine David. He's had it. He's sick and tired of year after year, month after month, running for his life, and nothing ever working out. He's lost his friend, his mentor, everything that matters to him, and he's sick of it. Now, before we move on, has anybody ever got angry and just been ready to do something really dumb? David's coming down the hill, and Abigail's a really wise woman, and she knows the way to most men's heart is through their stomach. And she already has these really cool raisin cakes prepared for some other banquet. And she takes them and a bunch of other food that uh, I don't even know what it was. But the raisin cakes seemed like a really good thing to me. So he, she brings those down and she meets him as he's coming down the hill. And David had just made a vow. If there's even one guy alive here, then I am not keeping my promises to God. Imagine how far David has gone. And that's when we meet Abigail. Please, Abigail says to David as she's bringing these cool raisin cakes, pay no attention, my lord, to the wicked man Nabal. He's just like his name. He, his name means fool and folly goes with him. And for me, your servant, I did not see the men that your lord sent. I had no idea that all the cool stuff you guys had done and how you protected us. Verse 26. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand. Hey, by the way, David, God has been protecting you and keeping you from doing really dumb stuff all along. May your enemies and all who are intent on harming you be like Nabal and let his gift, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to all your men. Here's some great food and we, we appreciate everything that you've done. And now, now watch what she does. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make, and watch what she does. She will make a lasting dynasty. She's speaking to David's heart. She's speaking to his highest values, his deepest aspirations. She's calling out of him what he wanted to do all along. That's what was most important to David. She said, David, you're going to leave a lasting dynasty. You fight the Lord's battle. You are bound securely in the Lord of the living. He cares about you. He's protecting you like a baby. And not only is he going to do that, but he's going to take and hurl a sling at your enemies because God is sovereign. He's in control. And if you 
hang in there. God will do something amazing with you. There's something cool about a friend that actually knows who we are, that can speak to our deepest aspirations and call out of us what we genuinely want to do. Wow, I'm kind of worked up because... Do you have that? Do you have someone who actually knows what it is that you value? And that you've given permission to speak to that? Watch how she finishes. When the Lord has fulfilled the Lord, every good thing he's promised concerning him and his appointed ruler, when God's done everything he said he's going to do, my Lord will not have his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenge himself. Hey, David, do you really want to carry with you this stupid mistake for all of your life? See, not only was Jonathan a great friend, but so was Abigail. Uh, Abigail was a true friend to David because she gave him wisdom through customized advice. See, there's something that comes with community, and it, it's cool in that it's emotional support and it's encouraging words, but it's also being able to specifically apply the Bible to our lives. The last one uh, I want to talk about this morning is a guy named Nathan, because David continued his downslide. He continued to move away from God without his good friends encouraging him to do the right stuff. In time to go to battle, David stays home, and instead of being with all the other men, he's out in the palace, and he's looking out, and he notices Bathsheba. Some of you are wondering, how could a man after God's own heart do something so stupid? You and I are capable of it. If we allow our hearts to get hard and we stop paying attention to God's spirit, we are capable of some pretty messed up stuff. David ends up sleeping with Bathsheba and the servant comes up to him and said, isn't this someone else's wife? Isn't this someone else's daughter? They didn't have the permission to say out loud, David, what you're doing is stupid. Because David was doing his own thing. There's something interesting in the text. Uh, over and over you get to see this phrase, David sent, David sent, David sent, David sent, David sent. David was making his own decisions, doing what he wanted to do at that point. And then all of a sudden in the text, something changes and it's really interesting and it says, the Lord sent. Now David was going down the wrong path. He was sleeping with Bathsheba and then he killed her husband and then he was doing everything to cover it up. And then God sends someone that David trusts named Nathan. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little wee lamb and he had bought. He raised it. He grew it up with animals and children. He shared his food, drank with his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. This guy had one and, and only one, and it was so important to him. A traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the wee lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, this man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he has done such a thing and had no pity. That guy's a jerk and an idiot and he had no right to do it. And here are some of the most courageous words in the entire Bible. Nathan said to David, you're the man. David, you're the man. You're the one that's acting selfishly and completely far from the Father and doing destructive things on your own. Do you have anyone in your life that has the courage to tell you the truth? You see, I think if you're looking for surrounding yourself with people, you might want to look for people that are going to encourage you and support you, point you towards God. People that are going to call out of you what you truly long to do and accomplish. And people that have the truth to tell you, have the courage to tell you the truth. 
Watch what David says, and we get to see a little of God's heart. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wife in your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have even given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what was so evil in his eyes. You see, Nathan was a true friend. Because he was able to help him get freedom through accountability. The question I want you to think about this morning is, um, before we get to the question, is there's three things that you can gain only through authentic community. Comfort through support, wisdom through customized advice, and freedom through accountability. Do you have a Jonathan? Is there someone in your life that can give to you, that brings something to you, that it gives you emotional support and encouragement? Do you have an Abigail, someone that can give you customized advice, can call out of you who you really are and what you want to accomplish? Do you have someone that can speak the truth to you even when you don't want to hear it? Now, I want you to think about something else. That not only is community something that benefits you, and not only should we look at it from the perspective of what do I get out of it, But what I've learned is that when we make the shift from trying to suck something out of people to kind of be like Jonathan where we're bringing something to people, it changes everything. There's something about your walk with God when you stop seeing people as what they bring and you start seeing people as what you can give, it changes everything. What if God wants you to be the Jonathan? What if God wants you to be the Abigail? What if God wants you to be the Nathan? You see, I think that God has a whole army of people in this church. And imagine if we can shift our perspective. Instead of saying, what can I get from them? What can I do on God's behalf? You see, there's something amazing that just skyrockets your faith and helps you walk with God when you are believing in someone else and calling out their best. And you have the courage to speak the truth. Some of you right now are saying, whoa, hang on a second. You mean you want me to go and confront that person? And God's already brought their name to you. God's already told you that you need to go and have a painful conversation with them, but you've said, no, somebody else can do it. Authentic community takes place when you're the one that does it. Why in the world should we want to have authentic community? Because it's the only place that we're going to get the support and encouragement that will push us towards God. It's the place where people will be able to call out of us who we are and what we really want to accomplish. It's the place where somebody can help us when we've taken the wrong turn and we're headed in the wrong direction. Get back on the right path. But not only is that, it's the place where we can be Jonathan and Abigail, and Nathan, to the people that God's placed in our path. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I I pray that this place would be a place where people get to know us. And we don't have to put on any masks. And we let people in. We let people in that will encourage and support us. We let people in that will call out our best and to tell us the truth. God, help us to be that to other people. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Would you do me a favor? Stand up and greet at least two people for 10 seconds each. (laughs) Amen.